welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray. The Lord knows we need it. And uh, so if you would do me a favor and let's go before the Lord in reverencing him. If you're able to stand, why don't you go ahead and stand as we go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come into the house of the Lord. Your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why is that, Father? Because your presence is here. And Lord, we know and we understand that your presence is not contained to just the four walls of a church building, Lord, but we are the temple of of Jesus Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and we carry the presence of God with us. But your word says that when two or more are gathered together, that you are there in the midst of them. So, Father, we thank you that as a congregation we can come and and, and dwell in the presence of God together. And, Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man. We don't come into this place to hear from a woman or to hear from a band. God, we don't come into this place to be entertained. But, Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word, Lord. I ask that it would be a seed planted in good ground that as we walk out of the building of the church, Lord, that this would be a seed, a word that would bear fruit in our lives, God. And we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else. But as co-laborers in the body of Christ, the Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would set your hand upon all the churches in the Inland Empire and all across the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon our Catholic brothers and sisters and our our Methodist and Episcopalian and Lutheran brothers and sisters and our Baptist brothers and sisters. Lord, I thank you that you set your hand upon Emmanuel Baptist and on Harvest Christian Fellowship, on Sandals, on, 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 on Abundant Living, Father, on Oak Valley, Father, on Crossroads, Lord, on Inland Christian Center, on The Way. Lord, I thank you that we are all members of your body, Father, serving in the ministry to build your kingdom, Lord, and we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else. We're so blessed to have brothers and sisters all across the world in, in, in different churches in a different fashion. And Lord, we give you the praise and we give you the glory and we give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, as you're seated, why don't you get your Bibles out? Let's turn to the book of Hebrews in the fourth chapter. So we get into the word of the Lord this morning. I'm excited for what God has in store for you and I. I know that it's going to be good. I know that you're going to get something out of it. I'm excited to speak on the subject that we have this morning. It's true and near and dear to my heart. In Hebrews, in the fourth chapter, we've been going line upon line, precept upon precept. And what that means is that's how the Bible is written. That's how we study it on Sunday mornings. And so now we've been going through the book of Hebrews for now several years. And we are coming to the tail end of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. So we're moving right along. God is good. And Pastor Dan brought an amazing message last week out of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. And we're going to continue on in the 14th verse where we started last week. So if you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles to church. If you can't bring them to church, then how are you going to use them at home, use them at work, wherever else? Bring the Word, bring the sword of the Spirit with you, study on it. Don't take my word for it. Just because I put it on the overhead doesn't mean it's true. It is, okay. I, it, because I put it on the overhead, it is true. But that doesn't mean that, that you don't have the responsibility to test it and to read it and go forth from there. So anyways, Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'll get off my soapbox and continue on. Hebrews, in the fourth chapter... 14th verse, we read, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now, Pastor Dan last week brought an amazing message about Jesus Christ, our great high priest, and why Jesus is great. Why? Because he did what we couldn't do. He went where we could not go, and he brought us along. Last week's message, I'll tell you what, if you didn't get a hold of that, you need to. You can get it online, grab a CD after service, what have you. But today I want to take a look at the tail end of the 14th verse. Where, it's, where we read, let us hold fast our confession. Now, the title of this morning's message is Holding On to Our Faith. Now, I want to give you, a, take a couple moments, and I want to focus in on some words. I want to take a quick moment and look at the last word of that verse in the 14th chapter, or the 14th verse, the confession. What is a confession? Well, when we think of a confession, the first thing we think of probably is, is what you would hear in, in a criminal circumstance. You know, when somebody maybe has done something and, and they've confessed to it. You know, as a kid, they've confessed to breaking the cookie jar or whatever it might have been. The confession is a statement of truth that reveals the truth behind something. Let's take a look at that in, in the legal stance. When, when there's a, a, a trial or investigation going on, there are suspects. 
They don't have the right. The, 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 our legal system allows us the right to be innocent until proven guilty. So we can't call somebody guilty until we can prove it. So we have suspects. And what happens is you've seen it in CSI and Law and & Order and all these different type of TV cop shows. You remember, imagine the, the gray room with the bricks and the dimly lit fluorescent light. And the cop stands there with a solid metal table and gets the confession out of, a, out of somebody. Before they confess, they're what we call a suspect. Because there's, we have an idea of something but we can't prove it. When somebody brings a confession, they have changed from being a suspect to now a perpetrator or, or, or the person that has done that. They have now revealed their identity to what the, the issue is. They have brought out the truth. Now, okay, now that may relate, you may understand that, but listen, I know that none of you in here are criminals. We've never been in that situation, so hopefully. So let me say it like this. A confession is something, it's a statement of the truth. It's something that you and I do. It's something that you and I say that we confess the old King James Version says profession. Let us hold fast to the profession. What is a profession? A profession is a statement that we make. We, uh, in, in Christian language, I call it Christianese. A lot of times you'll hear us say the profession of our faith. At the, at the middle of the service when we stand, we make a profession of our faith about our tithes and our offerings as we read off the list of things that we're believing for. So the, the author says, let us hold fast to our confession. Our confession is the statement of truth about you and I. The statement of truth about our faith. Now, you know, the interesting thing about faith is, and the interesting thing about God is, and the thing I love so much about it, is that God, when he inspired the scriptures to be written, they were not single track, they were not single-minded. What does that mean? Let me explain it to you like this. You know, we can read something about faith, and we can read something about healing, or we can read something about salvation and, and, and finances, and, and, and we say, okay, that this is subject X, and this is subject Y. And, and we can say, I clearly see in the scriptures that support this, and I clearly see in the scriptures that support this. But the more we get into the Word of God, and the more that the Holy Spirit speaks to us about the Word of God, the more we begin to realize that subject X and subject Y, although they may be on two separate categories, actually come together and work hand in hand. Case in point is if you've ever read a scripture, maybe years have gone by and you read a scripture and you understood it to, to, to mean this. And it spoke to you and the, and the Holy Spirit spoke to you as you read it and you, and you got this out of it. You got X out of it. And then you come back later on in your life and, and maybe years later, months later, even weeks later, you read that scripture. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit has spoke to you and now all of a sudden you get Y out of it. So you didn't just get X out of it. Now X obviously are fill in the blanks, whatever the scripture is. And then Y is something different. Now all of a sudden you realize that the scripture is much more than just single-minded, one-topic subjects. And God is not limited by our intellect. So when we talk... When we talk about holding on to our faith, I want to understand, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about single-minded subjects. This is a broad category that we can fit so many different ideas into. We have faith, faith for what we're believing for, faith for our prosperity, faith for our finances, faith for our children, faith for our jobs, faith for whatever it might be, something that we are believing in, faith. But then we also have the faith. Our faith. Our faith is our confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came, He died on the cross for us, that we are now adopted into the family of God. You know what I'm saying? You guys are on the same page with me? So we have faith that we're believing for, and we have the faith. And so what I want to talk to you today is about holding on to your faith. Now this can be broad spectrum, and that's what I want you to get a hold of today, is that I'm not speaking solely upon maybe the faith for something you're believing for, the health for your children, for the prosperity for your family, for a new job, for, for, for God to open doors in your life. That might be what you're believing for, but I also want to talk to the longevity of your faith, to hold on to our faith. And Hebrews, the fourth chapter, says, holding fast to our confession. Now I want to play a little bit more on words, and I want to tell you that the term hold fast is a modern translation. When it was written in the Greek, hold fast wasn't necessarily uh, used in that time. And let me translate, let me tell you what it means. To hold fast, when it was translated in the Greek, means this, to hold on to, to keep, to lay a hand or to lay a hold on, to retain. Going further, it means to, do not, to not to discard, to not let go, to keep carefully or faithfully. So with that in mind, the, the author of Hebrews says to us, let us hold fast, let us hold on to, let us keep, let us retain, let us not discard, let us keep carefully, let us keep faithfully our confession. So we see a subject here in holding fast. We see a subject of longevity. Holding fast equates or is the same as 
longevity, as making it through. Now, I want to say something to you. I, I hope that this isn't your belief system. Sometimes we have this idea that we can come and sit in a service, and at one point in our lives we can raise our hands, walk the altar, pray a prayer, go home, do our things the way we want to do, and have fire insurance for the rest of our lives. But I'm here to tell you today that that's not how God intended you and I to live. And our salvation is not the, 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 the end all or the means to an end, but rather the salvation that you and I encounter when we go before the Lord and we ask Him to come into our heart is more so the start of our race. And God has intended you and I, the church, His people, to be a longevity of generations, to carry on, to endure. The word endure we see several times in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, in the book of Matthew and in the book of Mark, I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. Jesus Christ says, they will hate you for my sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Again, we see this later on in Matthew. We'll go ahead and put that up on the screen. Jesus reiterates and he says, but he who endures to the end. So you need to understand that the reason that I'm talking to you about Holding on to your faith is that your salvation, the moment that you gave Jesus your heart and your life, was not the end, but rather the beginning. And it is a now a, a race for you and I to endure, to finish the race, to finish the fight, to be what God has called us to be. Are you with me? I know that that was a lot. I know that I spoke fast. But we got a lot to cover. So you say, Pastor Luke, you're going so fast for me. I could go even faster for you. No, I'm just kidding. I won't. But I need you to understand that we're talking about the broad spectrum of holding on to our faith, whether it's a belief, whether it's a promise that God has given to you, whether you're standing. How many of you guys are parents? Is any, are there any parents in the house today? Look at all of you parents. Congratulations. We're praying for you. <laughs> if you ever want to experience faith, have kids. Wow. You will believe God for, oh, man, it just doesn't stop. I solely believe I have a 16-month-old son. My sole purpose in life, along with my beautiful wife, Stacey, our sole purpose in life right now is to make sure he doesn't die. That's, that's what we do. That's, that's how he is. The kid, it's his faith. And we have got to learn how to hold on to our faith, whether it's the promises of God, or rather even, let's go further, to hold on to longevity of our belief so that we endure to the end, like Jesus Christ tells us that we must in order to meet him face to face and to hear those words that we all want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. So we're talking about holding on to our faith. And if you've got your Bibles, turn with me a few pages before the book of Hebrews to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, here Paul the Apostle is speaking to the young leader, Timothy. He's exhorting him. And in the book of 2 Timothy, we're going to be in the fourth chapter. In the third chapter, Paul the Apostle kind of lays it out for this young leader. And he tells him about the end times. You might know this. It says the end, in the end times, uh, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, a the perverse generation, so forth, so on. He kind of lays it out for Timothy and saying, listen, man, hard times are going to be ahead of you. There's going to be some stuff going on. You're going to have to endure. You're going to have to hold fast. You're going to have to hold on to your salvation, to not let it go, to, not, to, to, to retain it, to keep on to your faith, because all around you things may seem as though they're falling apart. And now he begins to exhort him now in the fourth chapter. And he, call, and he charges him in the first verse. And he, gives, he presents to him a charge. And then finally, uh, coming into the second verse in, in 2 Timothy, in the fourth chapter, Paul the Apostle comes to Timothy and he says to him, Timothy, I said that, he didn't say Timothy. Verse number two, he says, preach the word. Hallelujah. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Now I'm going to place some emphasis on the next few verses. I hope that you can catch on to my obviousness. Verse number three, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, did you catch my emphasis on they, their, He's talking about the people around Timothy. He's talking about the circumstances, the world that Timothy's living in, the people that he's preaching to, the people that he's going to minister to, the people that he's going to live with and his family members, all sorts of people. Our lives. We take this. This isn't Paul just talking to Timothy. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and I, saying that um, from every walks of life, there will be people they, there. But listen to this. In verse number five, now Paul turns you to coin. He speaks to Timothy. But you... 
He says, they, 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 they. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. But that doesn't apply to you, Paul the Apostle says. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Listen to what Paul the Apostle says. He says, Timothy, people are going to be messed up all around you. They're going to turn away from the word of God. They're not going to be able to, to handle it. They're going to do their own thing. They're going to make their own teachers. They're going to tell you that you're teaching bad things and they're teaching the right thing. And he says, don't pay attention to any of that, but you be watchful in your life to endure, to hold fast, Timothy, the confession of your faith, to hold fast what God has put on your heart, to hold fast the foundation in which you stand. And he says, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. You know what's interesting? You have a ministry. It doesn't matter if ever in your life you stand in front of a pulpit, you wear a suit and you speak to people, you still have a ministry. You don't just come to the church and participate with Pastor Jim's ministry, Pastor Dan's ministry, Pastor Luke's ministry. You have a ministry. Your ministry is your family, your workplace, your friends, the people that you come in contact with. Paul the Apostle is exhorting Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Guess what? That's not just reserved for Timothy. That's not just reserved for Pastor Dan, for Pastor Luke, for Pastor Becker and Pastor Eleanor, for Pastor Jim. That's for you and I alike all together. Why? We call that the Great Commission. And Jesus, as he was ascending to heaven, he exhorted, he said, go into all the world. Preach and teach to every creature. It is our destiny. It is our mission. No matter who we are, no matter how high or how low we are on the total pole of society, our mission, our work is to have a ministry of evangelism to tell the world about Jesus Christ. So don't just think as you read this that Paul the Apostle is talking to Timothy. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. And he says, but you be watchful. Apply that to you. Be watchful. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the ministry. Hold on. We talked about the word endure. Endure till the end, Paul says, because everybody else in the world will fall apart around you, but you, but you, church, but you hold on to your confession and do the work of your ministry. Fulfill what God's plan in your life is. So today we're talking about holding on to our faith. I've got some things in my studies that the Lord has spoken to me out of these out of this, the, the, this verses that we just read. So I've got some things I want to share with you today. Talking about holding on to your faith. Can we, can we go through three things this morning? Are you guys with me? Can you endure the word of God with Pastor Luke this morning? Okay, good. Because even if you couldn't, I'm still going to do it. We're talking about holding on to your faith. Number one, prepare for anything. You and I have got to be prepared for anything. You know, I think of a quote. There's a certain movie that as a, as a young adult, Pastor Joey's on the front row, uh, and he, could, he can concur and he'll, he'll have a big smile when he knows that there was a certain movie that when we were in Bible college, we probably watched this movie at least every other night. And I, 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 we bought the DVD, and even to this day, I have the DVD in my little DVD storage area, and if I see this movie on TV, I will stop what I'm doing and watch this movie. I just really like it. I would say it's probably in my top five movies. And I remember there was a quote, and there, the, in the movie there was, a, there was a time when this particular character, the main character, was giving a speech to somebody that, it was, it was a young man, but it was actually his son. He didn't know because of the, the drama in the story. And he said, the, the, during his birthday speech, he said to him, life is a storm. One moment you'll be basking in the sun, and in the next you'll be shattered on the rocks. And you know, the bottom line is, is that life is a storm. Life has a way of presenting itself to us. I don't know if you have ever experienced it, but I'll tell you, life doesn't have a way, it doesn't have a tendency of phoning us the day before a crisis, the day before we lose somebody that we love and we, it was unexpected, the day before uh, the, the economy goes under, whatever it might be, life doesn't have a way of saying, hey, guess what? Grandma's going to die tomorrow. Hey, guess what? Dad's going to pass away. Hey, guess what? You're going to lose your job. For some reason, there's not a hotline that phones us when things are about to happen. Why? Because life has a tendency for, to, 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 to just 
to show up on our doorstep, and we have got to deal with it. And the Bible tells us, Paul exhorts Timothy to be prepared. As a matter of fact, we were just there in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, as we look through these scriptures, as we develop our points, Paul says to him in the second verse, he says, be ready in season and out of season. Be ready in season and out of season. Why? Because you can be ready when the sun is shining on your back, but what really matters is when you're shattered on the rocks. And let me tell you something. If you're going through a period where you feel like you're shattered on the rocks, I have one word to tell you. The word is grace. Paul the Apostle told us that the grace of Christ is sufficient for us. And somebody who himself had been shattered literally on the rocks three times can attest to you and I that through the hardships of our life, we can rest assured that God is with us. God will not depart from us, that the, Christ, that the grace of, of our Lord and Savior is sufficient for us. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. But that's for another day. But I want to tell you that life has a way of presenting itself. And Paul exhorts Timothy to be ready in season and out of season. It's like, uh, it's like a, a professional athlete. NFL, the season's about to start. The professional football league is about to start. Do you think that once the Super Bowl's over, these guys go and they sit on their couch and they go and they, they take their, you know, six-month-long vacation and they go to McDonald's and they eat every day a Big Mac and a large fry and they have a good time and then all of a sudden preseason starts and in the three days they lose all the weight that they lost and then they get back into the, and they're better than the year before? No. They're in a continual state of training, a continual state of pushing themselves so that when the time comes, they are ready to go. Let me give you another example really quickly. Do I have any veterans or active servicemen? If, you're, if you've served in our, in our nation's armed forces, can you just let us know? L give me a wave. Hey, listen, look at all you guys. Thank you so much for your service. We love and appreciate you. You guys, above all else, will know the example that I'm about to say. When you signed up for the military, whatever branch, Navy, Army, Arm, uh, Air Force, uh, Marines, whatever, Coast Guard, whatever you have, when, it, when you signed up for the, for the branch of one of our nation's armed forces, you went to your recruiter's office and you signed your name away and you signed a commitment. They didn't just hand you a standard issue M16. Here's your uniform. Okay, go have a good time. You're going to be stationed over here. Learn as you go. They don't do that, right? What do they do? They sent you somewhere. Anybody who's ever served in the armed forces has a tendency to remember this period of their life. We call it basic training, boot camp. They send you somewhere. What do they do there? They teach you. They train you. They show you a weapon. They show you how to hold a weapon. They show you how to shoot a weapon. They show you how to carry the armory and the arsenal that you have. They show you how to wear your uniform. They show you how to dress nice. They show you how to stand at attention. They show you how to stand at ease. They show you how to walk in unison with somebody else. They show you how to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and run 10 miles and then go back to bed and get up an hour later and do it again. They show you what it's like to be broken down mentally and to be broken down physically. They get in your face, they curse at you, they scream at you, they make you hate them, and you wonder why. But then all of a sudden when you get stationed to wherever you're at, you now have a preparedness for what life brings for you. You know how to use that standard issue weapon. You know how to use the specialty in which you've been trained. And then guess what? Once you've been stationed, for those of, those of you who are veterans and servicemen, you know this. Once you have been stationed, guess what? You don't sit there for the next four to six years or however long your service commitment was and do nothing. What do you do? You drill. And then what happens when your drill's done? You drill again. And you drill some more. And they drill you again. And then they drill you more. And then, they drill, and then guess what? That drill's over and you go into another drill. Why? Because they want you to be ready as a service member, as a member of the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the, the, the Air Force, in a moment's notice when a crisis or an event happens, to be ready to ship up, to be ready to, be ready to pick up and go and handle the issue at hand without causing a jeopardy to your life and the person next to you. But through the training, through, the, through, the, through what they've put into you, you are now prepared for anything that may come your way. Makes sense. Pastor Luke, I'm glad you described the military process. I always wondered what it was. Wow. <laughs> but how about this in our lives? We go to church once a week. We go to church twice a month. Uh-oh. We go to church once a month. And then we expect when life comes at us, and when we leave the Bible in the back seat of our car, when we leave it on the shelf to collect dust, 
And we expect when life to come at us, when the storms of life to come at us, to be effective, to be prepared for anything at a moment's notice. And we wonder why sometimes in life we aren't prepared or we aren't effective how God has called us to be. Why? Because Paul exhorts Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen, around you the world is going to fall apart. But you have got to be ready in season and you have got to be ready out of season so that whatever life has thrown at you, you are prepared to handle it. Are you with me this morning? In Luke, the 12th chapter, I'll just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. Luke, the 12th chapter, Jesus Christ is talking about the preparedness of his servants. And he says in verse number 35, let your waist be girded and your lamps be burning. Okay, wait a minute. What does our waist be girded and our lamps be burning mean? Let me pull it into 21st century. Put your leatherman on your waist and get your flashlight ready to go. Okay? And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Okay, what does that mean? This is what Jesus Christ is saying. You need to be Batman's Alfred. When Batman's out fighting crime, Alfred's in the Batcave ready to support Batman. Batman says, Alfred, who's this guy? Batman comes home, and he's at the garage door of the Batcave, and he's knocking on the door. Alfred, let me in. He's not going to be really happy with Alfred if Alfred doesn't push the garage door opener and let the Batmobile roll into the bat, bat cave. Jesus Christ says you and I are like servants who stand ready for the master to come. And a moment's notice, when he knocks on the door, I open the door because I am ready in season or out of season. Whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it does not matter what time it is. As a servant of the Most High God, I am ready for whatever life has to throw at me. You and I have got to be prepared. If we want to hold on and endure, have longevity in our lives, we have got to be prepared for what life has to throw at us. Are you with me this morning? Can I preach? Amen. Amen. Okay. Holding on to our faith. We're talking about number two this morning. Number two, you and I have got to put away the flesh and prioritize the word. That's a mouthful. But put away the flesh and prioritize the word. Here's what I want you to know. The Bible tells us that the flesh and the spirit are at enmity with each other. Another big word. Let me bring it back home to you now. The flesh and the spirit, the old man and the new man, the, 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 the sinful man and the Christian man don't like each other. And now I could get myself in a little bit of trouble but I, when I say this, but each and every one of us kind of deal with a little bit of schizo in this world. Why? Because we've got the old man that said, this is how I want to be. And we got the new man through Christ Jesus that says, this is how I am. And this is how I am says, that this is how I want to be. And this is how I want to be says, I don't want to be that way. I want to be this way. And you have a continual fight. And you and I, in order to hold fast to our faith, hold on to our confession, hold on to what God has told us to do, we have got to put away the old man, put away the flesh, take it, package it up, put it in a drawer, move to a different city so that it stays over there and it doesn't follow you. And then secondly, we have got to prioritize the word of God. Why? Because when we remove the old if we don't replace it with the new, the word of God, the new creation that the word of God says, guess what? I don't know how it is. It's kind of weird how it does us, but there's a way that our flesh has a tendency to return. Has anybody else experienced that? I am a new creation, but somehow that old man seems to keep following me. And we have got to replace the old with what God says is the new, the new creation that we are. And we have to prioritize the word. If we put away the flesh and we, we put in uh, self-help books and, 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 and motivational books and, and, and behavioral science things, then guess what? That's great. We might be better people so socially speaking, but inside, where it counts, when God looks at the heart, when God looks at the soul, we are still empty. Why? Because we have not replaced the old with the word of God. And you have got to put a priority on the word of God to say, listen, this is truth. It may hurt when I read it. It may not feel good when I read it and apply it to my life. It hurts. But to say that I'm going to put a priority in following this so that I can hold fast, so that I can hold on, so that like Jesus Christ said about me, I can endure to the end. Look what Paul says to Timothy. In verse number 3 and 4, he says, 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Paul didn't say the time will come when they won't endure persecution. He didn't tell Timothy the time will come when they didn't endure, the, the, you know, their mother-in-laws, uh, uh, you know, living with them. The time didn't come when they wouldn't endure their job. He said the time would come when they won't endure sound doctrine. Can you do, you, do you get what Paul's saying? The time will come when the word of God, listen, sound doctrine, it, it's an endurance. By its very nature, it rubs us the wrong way. And it's going to hurt when we put sound doctrine into our lives. Why? Because it rubs our flesh the wrong way. Hey, I want to go get drunk. Hey, I want to go smoke that. Hey, I want to do whatever I want to do. Hey, it's my right. But the word of God says, no, don't do this. Don't do that. Avoid here. Follow after Jesus Christ. And it rubs us the wrong way. And there will be a time when people cannot endure the word of God. But listen to the danger that comes from that. Because they couldn't let go of their flesh. But according to their own desires, that's their flesh, because they have itching ears, a sign of their flesh, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn aside their ears from the truth, the word of God that we should place a priority in, and they will be set aside to fables. Boy, if there's ever a time when we live this, the time is now. You've seen it. And I'm not here to stand on a soapbox and say who should be this and who should be that. But because we can't shed our flesh, because people can't shed our flesh, they bring up to themselves teachers that tell them what they want to hear so that they can justify the sin and the situation that they're in so that they can feel good about their self. But the bottom line is, as the Word of God tells us, that Paul exhorts Timothy that we will have to endure sound doctrine. You may not like hearing it. You may feel like you get spanked when you hear it. But let me tell you something. The more you apply it and prioritize it in your life, the less it hurts because the more the new man receives it and digests it and lives it and applies it. And, and, it, and it's, a, it's a slippery slope. But we have got to put aside the flesh put aside our own desires and move on with the things of God and put a priority on God's word. Are you with me? Jesus says in Luke, the sixth chapter, verse number 46, I'll put it up on the overhead for the sake of time. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things of which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. I love this. Jesus just said, listen to me. I will paint you a picture of what somebody who does prioritizes the word is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house, and it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But listen to what verse 49 says. He says, but he who heard it and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation, against it, against, which against the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our foundation. Jesus Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. Jesus Christ is the foundation on which we build our lives on. Why? Because everything else is sinking sand. And when we build the foundations of our life, our beliefs, our, our confession, then all of a sudden, if we build that on sand, guess what? When life has a way of bringing its storms, that house falls. And we find ourselves picking up the pieces, moving on to the next house that doesn't have a foundation. But until you and I build on the foundation of Jesus Christ and we live a life of endurance and longevity and we endure sound doctrine even when it hurts, that's how we endure to the end. That's how we hold on to our confession. You, got, you guys got enough in you for one more? Can we do one more this morning? This is my favorite one because this is... Very, very pertinent. Holding on to our faith. We're talking about how to hold on to our faith. Living a life of endurance. Number three, we have got to patrol our lives. Patrol your life. You and I have got to be like the policeman walking the beat, keeping our eyes open for what life has to bring at it. Whatever's around the corner, we have got to be prepared for it. We have got to patrol our lives. You know, one of the things that we do is life has a tendency of bringing things at us. But how about the things that we put out of us? How about we patrol what we say? We patrol what we think. We patrol who we hang out with. 
We patrol who we, uh, who we speak about certain things with. We patrol what we allow to come into our lives. We patrol what we allow to influence us as people. We patrol and we watch our lives and keep guard over it. You know, the Bible tells us to guard our hearts. Why? Because out of it spring the issues of life. So we have got to patrol. You know, when you're in a friendship, you have acceptance. You've been there before. I was just listening to somebody tell the, tell the story about this. You know, if you've ever smoked, you've ever drank, maybe you've ever smoked some drugs or, or did any of that stuff, chances are very high that you didn't do it alone your first time. Because when you are with somebody, you feel accepted by them. And it's that addiction to acceptance that you and I as humans have that allows us to remove our guard in order to experience more acceptance from that person, which allows us, which puts us in a place to do things that we normally wouldn't do. Why? Because we have lowered our guard. So you and I have got to guard our lives. We have got to guard our relationships. What are we letting our guard down for? Are we letting it down to the people? Are we hanging out with people that maybe we shouldn't? Are we allowing people to speak into our lives that maybe we shouldn't? Are we allowing things to come into our eyes that we're watching that maybe we shouldn't? We have got to patrol our lives if we want to hold on to our faith. Why? Let me show you. Look what Paul says to Timothy in verse number five. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Timothy, you want to finish the race? You want to fight the fight, Paul says? You have got to keep watch of your life. You have got to keep watch of what you allow to come into your heart. You have got to keep watch of what you allow to influence your life. And you have got to, you have got to, you have got to keep watch of what comes out of your mouth. To fulfill your ministry. Guys, I got one more verse. Can you handle one more verse today? 1 Peter, 5th chapter, verse number 8. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. We kind of know this verse. It's a little popular. We've heard this before. You say, Pastor Luke, I've never heard it before. Okay, you're going to hear it right now. 1 Peter, the 5th chapter, verse number 8. Peter's writing. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's hope still, it says. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, may perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So you will endure afflictions. You will have hardships in your life. It's just the way life is. But in verse number 8, Peter tells us a warning. Put it up on the overhead again one more time, guys. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now let me say something for a minute. I want to kind of deviate. I want to get on a little uh, rabbit trail, I guess, if you could say. Let's talk about our perspective of our enemy, our adversary. We've read that he's like a lion. We read, though, that the word of God from children, some of you from children's church or youth church, have read that if I resist the devil, he'll flee. And that's the truth. I'm not making any, 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 not playing that down in any sense because that's the word of God and we speak the word of God. But I think you and I, like we talked about, have to be prepared for anything earlier today. We have to have a, a realistic understanding of our adversary and his spiritual forces that come against us. You know, you may want to believe that the devil comes after you, but let me tell you something, he's got an army as well. And the Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, physical, but are spiritual. And there is a spiritual battle in your life and for your life that you may not even realize. But you and I have to have a mature approach. And the Bible tells us to be sober, to be vigilant, because the devil, our adversary, and his army are like roaring lions seeking whom he may devour. Now, oftentimes we get this idea of the devil as though he's a pestering fly. Ah! Get away from me. Temptation comes. You stop it comes back again, knock it off. And we, we apply the bug spray of the scripture to our life and we expect that to work. But let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that right here that the devil is a roaring lion. Satan and his forces, the spiritual forces that are out after you, they're not here, guys, let's be real. They're not here to pester you. Satan's not here to irritate you. Yeah. He's not here to bug you. He's not here to make sure that you have a hard time in life. What? What? 
Yes, he is. Yes, he is, Pastor Luke. He's here to devour you. He's here to destroy you. He's here to destroy your wife, your husband, your marriage, your kids, your family, everything you have, everything you stand for, everything you stand on. He is here for you and your destruction. And it is time for us, the church, to understand that there is a battle. And if we are not prepared, we are like the prey of that roaring lion. And we get this idea again, okay, well, the devil's not a pestering fly. He's a rot lion. And we get this idea of a, of a lion in the Serengeti kind of wandering about, looking at the zebra. Rawr, and he roars at the zebra, and the zebra falls over, and he eats it. That's not how lions are, guys. If you've ever seen the National Geographic Channel, you've ever seen... National Geographic magazine, you've ever seen the battle at Kruger on YouTube? You know how lions hunt? They hunt in packs. You know how lions hunt? They hunt in the middle of the day when the sun is on the, the back of the zebra, on the back of the gazelle, all is quiet, the birds are chirping, and they crawl in the grass and they stay low. And they get within feet of their prey without them knowing. And they come at them from all directions. And they pounce on them when they least expect it, but that's not it. Do you know how lions hunt? Lions go after the sick and the weak. What does that say about you and I in our walks with God? The devil is like a roaring lion seeking out who is sick in their faith and who is weak in their belief. And that is why today we are talking about holding on to our faith because it is my desire as a pastor, it is Pastor Dan, Pastor Jim, it is God's desire as you as children of God to not be sick in your faith, to be sickly. It is not God's desire for you to be weak or to be the runt, but rather the head of the pack. And the lion doesn't go after the biggest elephant, he goes after the sick one. And you and I have got to patrol our lives to be on guard to understand that when we are down in our faith, you better expect an attack to come. Can I share something personal with you? Every time I have preached on a Sunday morning, every time I have preached on a Sunday morning here at the church, including this weekend, I have had a sinus infection, a cold, or a flu. Every time. You say, Pastor Luke, you've kind of been on a lot lately. Yeah. But don't you know that those are attacks of the enemy? The last time I preached, Pastor Jim was on vacation, and I had a fever on Friday of 103 degrees. And he called me and said, I'll come off vacation. You don't worry about it. You know, you're sick. You need to get some rest. I'll come off. I'll get a message together. I'll come in. You just get some rest. You need... And I told him, I said, you know what? I'm tired of these physical attacks. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of the devil coming after me and trying to pick me off like a sick and a weak one. And if I have a temperature tomorrow on Saturday morning, I will still preach the word of God. And it is time for you and I, the church, to understand that when spiritual adversaries come against us, we have got to be ready to fight so that we can, like the book of Hebrews tells us, hold on, hold fast to the confession of our faith. Hold fast to our belief. Hold fast so that like Jesus Christ has told us we must that we would endure and have longevity in our walks with God. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord this morning? There's one more thing I want to do. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. Just give me a few more minutes of your time. I want to ask, please don't get up. Please don't walk around. Let me ask you a question. And you say, well, you know, why, why can't I get up? Why can't I move around? Let me tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit's going to minister to us through this question. And when you get up, when you walk around, and you got to go to the bathroom, you get out of here, people watch you leave. They look at your shoes. They look at your shirt. And they lose distraction. And they, they lose what they were thinking about. So let's not do Let's just have a little bit of reverence just for a few more minutes. Let me ask this question. Just please remain seated. Just a few more moments of your time. Let me ask this question. I want each and every one of you to examine your hearts. You know, it'd be a shame for us to come and have the word of God to hear the word of God and not have the opportunity for you to examine whether or not you're going to get into heaven and whether or not you're going to get into hell because ultimately that's what we all want to know. So let me ask this question to you today. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but you know, nobody would know the answer except you and God. So why don't we go over some of those answers today? You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm not sure if I believe in heaven. I'm not sure I believe in hell. I'm not sure that I, I, I believe that there's a God somewhere, but I'm not sure about Jesus and all these other things. You know what? Just because you believe in your head that heaven's not real or hell's not real or because you're not sure where Jesus 
you know, where, where you stand with that because you're not sure about the Bible, things of that nature, doesn't mean it's not real. Let me tell you this. You don't see the wind, but you know that it exists. You don't know where it comes from, but you know that it blows. And just because you say in your head that heaven's not real because you've never seen it, because you say in your head because hell's not real because you've never seen it, doesn't mean it's not true. It's time for you and I to get a hold of reality and understand that God thought it important enough to say it in his word of God, in, in his word. Jesus thought it important enough to teach it. The, the, the word of God, important enough to be preserved over thousands of years so that you and I could understand and believe in it. So it's time for us to take it serious. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I hope I get to heaven. I sure think I'm going to get to heaven. I want to go. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you hope you're going to get into heaven that you'll find yourself there? That because you think that you're going to get to heaven, yeah, I think so, that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you hope that you're going to get into heaven, that God's going to look down upon you and say, man, they wanted it so bad that I'm going to give it to them. Nowhere in the Word of God do you find that. <clears throat> well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim any other type of world religion. So doesn't that mean that by default, by classification, that I'm going to go to heaven? America is supposedly a Christian nation. Where do you get that you go to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim? And they have their different religion, religious beliefs, so therefore that means that you, by default, are going to get into heaven. Where do you see that? Where can you find that in the Word of God? Nowhere. Well, but you know, but Pastor Luke, you know, my parents took me to church as a child. I went to Sunday school, Sabbath school, or catechism classes. I was baptized or christened. We went to church on Christmas and on Easter all my life. My parents told me that we were Christians. So doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you were baptized, because somebody blew smoke and water over you as a child, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter, because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes or catechism classes, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you attended church, that you're going to get your way into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible will you find that because there's more to it than that. How about this? Pastor Luke, I'm a good person and good people go to heaven. All I have to do is be good. Where do we get that from? Where do we believe that if we don't rob the 7-Eleven, if we don't cheat on our taxes, if we do more good in our life than we do bad, that we'll find ourselves in heaven? Where did we get that from? Because people couldn't endure sound doctrine and made up teachers of their own. But here I'm here to tell you that, you know what the Bible tells us about our good works? The Bible tells us that according to God's righteousness, our good deeds are like filthy rags, which means, church, nothing you and I could do on our own would ever, ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I, I, I worked in the youth ministry. I worked in the children's ministry. I grew up in, in youth or children's. I sang in the choir. I was an usher. I've even carried the pastor's Bible. I have a card in my wallet that says I'm a member of a church. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Where does it say in the Word of God that because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you served in the children's or the youth ministry at a church, you sang in the choir, or you were an usher, that you're going to get into heaven? Where do you see that in the Word of God? Nowhere. Nowhere do you find that. Well, but Pastor Luke, I know who God is. I, I know who Jesus is. I, I know about Moses and Jonah and Abraham. I've memorized John 3, 16 and a few other verses. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God and Jesus is, yet they're not finding their way into heaven. The Bible also tells us that the devil himself knows the scripture when he, quote, when he quoted it to Jesus in the wilderness, yet he's not on his way to heaven. The Bible tells us that, that the devil and hell and the demons in hell know about Paul and Moses and Jonah, yet they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because there's more than just carnal knowledge. As a matter of fact, in the book of John in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus this. He says, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Before I tell you Jesus' answer, let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. What does that mean to us today? That means that Nicodemus had dedicated the first years of his life, most likely the first 18 years at least of his life, to studying and memorizing the Scripture, the Word of God. It means that Nicodemus was welcomed into the temple to teach the Word of God. It means that Nicodemus had placed a priority on the Word of God. He wore the right clothes, he said the right things, did all the right things, and when he comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? You would think that Jesus, based on Nicodemus' lifestyle and decisions and his title, would tell Nicodemus, pat on the back, and man, you just keep on going, great is your reward in heaven. But Jesus looks to Nicodemus and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've heard that term, Hollywood popular culture has made a mockery out of that. You think radical, crazy, out of control, weirdo Christianity. 
But let me tell you something, church. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Listen, God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. He's not after your mental ascent of who he is. God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation speaking to the church says to the church people like you and I doing good things listening to the word of God says I know your works when I come back I better find you hot or I better find you cold he says because if I find you lukewarm I will vomit you from my mouth Whoa. harsh words vulgar statement designed to get our attention and here's what Jesus is saying when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you hot or he better find you cold because if he finds you lukewarm in your relationship with him, he will vomit you out, spit you out, reject you out of the kingdom of God. You're deceived in thinking you're going to make it all the way to the end if you're living a lukewarm relationship. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what it means in regards to your relationship with Jesus Christ. It means that you're up and you're down and you're in and you're out. You're kind of floating around in your relationship, ping-ponging back and forth, to and from. you got too much of the world in you to enjoy the, the things of God, and you've got too much of the things of God in you to, and, to enjoy the world. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against Him. You're kind of riding the fence, right, hanging out in the middle ground. And Jesus Christ says Himself that if that be you when it comes time for you to meet your Maker, that you are deceived in thinking you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Well, then how do we get to heaven, Pastor Luke? I'm glad you asked. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate that you get to God your way. You get, I'll get to God my way. We'll all get there the same. Love wins. Let me tell you something. Love did win. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross so that you and I could have salvation. And how do we do that? Through and only through Jesus Christ. The words of Christ himself is, is he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man, no man goes to the Father except through him. So, you know, let's not do it your way. Let's not even do it my way. Let's not do it in some well-meeting committee or author's way. Today, let's get to God his way. Jesus Christ also said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible real loud, just like that. And if you've never given him all your heart, you've never given him all your life, in a moment I'm going to ask you to be bold and put your hand up. We'll do it all together at the same time. And when you raise your hand, what you're doing is you're saying, I want to, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart. I want to give him all of my life. You say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand in, in the air, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed because somebody's going to see me. You know what? I'm not going to embarrass you because you put your hand up. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment then an eternity in hell because you couldn't raise your hand in a welcome and warm and loving place? The decision's yours. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way in. He's not going to make his way in. God has already done everything he can by giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang a spectacle naked on the cross so that you and I can confess him in our lives. Surrender our lives, our heart and our life to him. Give him all of our heart. Give him all of our life. So who should raise their hand? If you've never given them all of your heart, if you've never given them all of your life today, let's make it the day. You pop your hand up, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? If you've never given them, if you're not sure, maybe I did this as a kid, but I don't know, you've never made a public profession of your faith, in a moment, when I count to three, get your hand up, I'll see it, you can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? Finally, if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to God, today, let's make it the day that you go forward for God. You know, the bottom line is, is, church, that tomorrow is not promised. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And it's a gamble that you can't afford to make on your eternal life to walk out of this place without making sure today that you're headed for heaven and leaving hell behind. So all across this auditorium, all at the same time, I want to count to three. If that's you, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're not sure, you need to make sure. If you've been living lukewarm, if that's you in a moment, when I hit three, get your hand up so I can see it. All across this auditorium, all at the same time. Hands are getting ready to go up. Here we go. I'm going to count. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. One, two, three. I got you. Put your hands up so I can see it. Four, I got you. Five, I got you. Six, where are you at? I see somebody pointing. Give me a little wave so I can see. Seven, praise God. 
eight, nine, I got you. In the family rooms, is there anybody in the family rooms today? One in the family rooms, 10. I got you, I see your hand. 10 wise people, where are you at? Say, man, I wonder if I should do this. I wonder if I should do this. You need to get your hand up. I got that hand, I got you right over here. 10 wise people. You're saying in the house, man, I wish this guy would shut up. I want to get out of here. Let's move forward for God today. Get your hand up so I can see you. Put it right back down. Ten wise people. Anybody else in the house this morning? Well, praise God for ten wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Here's what I want to do. For the ten of you that raised your hand, the five others of you that didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And I want you to grab your coat, your purse. You know what? It's 115 degrees outside. You don't have a coat. <laughs> I want you to grab your, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. And come meet me at the altar. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. Let us pray with you. Let us help you today. If that's you, you raise your hand. Come on. Be bold. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. And come on up. If that's you, you come. Come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on down. You come, come on. You're not too old. You're not too young. If that's you, come on. You can come. Come on. Come on from the back. Come on from the family rooms. If that's you, come on down. We'll wait. You come on down. You can come. Come on. Praise God. Hey guys, listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is a new day. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's like the coolest pastor. What he's going to do, nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there and he's going to pray with you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. He's going to give you some free stuff. A book that our senior pastor wrote, real small, not a big book, called Welcome to Your Destiny. Easy reading. says, hey, I got saved. Now what do I do from here? He's also going to invite you to a program. You guys can come on. He's going to invite you to a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Like when you go to a gym and you see a personal trainer, and they help you build those muscles and get strong and make sure like Popeye, you're eating your spinach. We're not going to make you eat any spinach, but we're going to meet with you right, right before service for 15 minutes for five weeks. Real easy. Somebody will meet with you, teach you some things about the Word of God to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to the junk that you came from. And I want to ask one more thing. I know it's a lot to take in, but I want to ask one more thing. The Spiritual Personal Training Program is a five-week program. But I want to ask for you to commit 12 months, one year, to sitting under the Word of God in, in this church, to hear the Word of God, to get it into your life, and to see. I promise you, I guarantee you, if you let the Word of God affect and impact your life and you get it in your, in your life for one year, I promise you, you'll look back and never regret the decision that you made today. And you will be stronger one year from now than you have ever been in your life, spiritually speaking. So I want to ask for that commitment to you. So if you guys would just go right over here with Pastor Dave. Hallelujah.